We're going to have our reading now from the Bible, and Irene Aitken is going to read the passage which is set out on the order of service. If you don't have Bibles with you, then you're able to follow the reading, and the hope is that when it comes to the sermon, you will have these words in front of you so that when I refer to the verses, you will see what they are saying. Philippians 2 verses 12 to 18, because we've missed out a week where we're actually combining two of the texts together under a a different heading. Philippians 2, let's hear God's word. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. As you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast in the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. How to be good. That's the title of a book that was published this summer. and went right to the top of uh, fiction's best-selling list in the United Kingdom. Nick Hornby, very popular author of the book, has written several others, including two that have already been made into films, Fever Pitch, which was about football, and High Fidelity, which was about pop music. But this was his latest, How to Be Good. It's insightful and humorous, and at times serious, as this quotation will perhaps show. The leading character, Katie, says this, All I know is I want to live a better life. I want us to live a better life. And how do we do that? I don't know. I cannot help but feel that all this sounds very ominous indeed. I think there are many people at Christmas time who want to be good. In Dundee, over the festive season, the local authorities used to uh, put up in the Caird Hall, at the top of the building of the Caird Hall in City Square, um, the words, Peace and Goodwill to All Men. And I guess they hoped that there would be some kind of spin-off in the life of Dundonians, some hope. But I think that there are many people, particularly at this season who would like to be good but find they can't. And we ourselves who profess the Christian faith and belong to the Christian church um, very probably feel at Christmas time real longings to be better Christians. But in the frantic, frenetic busyness which is the modern Christmas we very likely discover that family tensions and pressures in personal life means that peace and goodwill to all men goes out the window very quickly. How to be good? Now, in simple terms, this is the issue, I think, that Paul is addressing in the second chapter of his letter to the Philippians. For although the Philippians are a committed and uh, caring Christian congregation, It seems that their behavior was in danger of compromising their testimony in the community. You may recall a few weeks ago in verses 2 and 3 that Paul refers to selfish ambition, vain deceit, and self-interest. And these are obviously in evidence in the church, to some extent at least, in Philippi. And now in our passage that we read together this morning... In verse 14, he refers to complaining or arguing. And again, obviously, there's evidence of this and signs of this in some sectors of the church. So here then was the problem. 
And here in chapter 2 is the teaching on how to be good as Christian people in a Christian church. And the Christian approach to behaviour and ethics is really quite unique, as Nick Hornby concedes in his book. Let me give you one other quotation. Again, the leading character saying this. When I look at my sins, and if I think they are sins, then they are sins, I can see the appeal of born-again Christianity. I suspect that it's not the Christianity that is so alluring, it's the rebirth. Because who wouldn't wish to start all over again? Now that's interesting, isn't it? So how are we to be good? For example, in dealing with the complaining and argumentative spirit which we find within ourselves and find perhaps within the church at times. And uh, it is a spirit which grips many of us at times in the church, doesn't it? How are we to conform to the instruction given to us in verse 14 when Paul says, Do everything without complaining or arguing. Now the Christian approach to conduct, let me say it again, is quite unique. And it is, in a word, cultivating Christ likeness. Christ is to be the model for our conduct. And you see, that's the model that Paul has been setting before the Philippians in chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. And after completing the description, he says in verse 12, Therefore, my dear friends. And it's as though he's saying, well, I've set before you the model of Christ. I've given you a picture of the model mindset of Jesus Christ. Now, you Christians, model your own mindset on his mindset. After all, there's no, there's no point in having a model unless we model ourselves on the model. That's the point. He's making. And especially at Christmas time, the model of Christ's mindset is made very vivid to us in the readings that we hear and the lovely carols that we sing. Lo, within a manger lies he who built the starry skies. Now, the movement of the model mindset of Jesus Christ, described in verses 6 to 11, has a U-shape. It's not a U-turn, but it's a U-shape. Let me sketch it for you. Jesus Christ came from heaven and went down and down and down to the lowest point he could go before he came up and rose to the highest place he could be. And in the downward side of this U-shaped curve that we are thinking about at Christmas, Jesus' mindset meant that he gave up his rights in order to save us in our needs. So we are to model our mindset on Christ's mindset. And that means that we join this downward movement. We join it and we go down. Why is it so often that we complain and argue in our lives and in the church? Very often, isn't it, because we've got an inflated sense of our rights in some issue or another? Isn't it because we somehow perceive that our rights have huge significance compared with the needs of others? So you see, in modeling ourselves upon Christ, we commit ourselves to giving up our selfish rights for the needs of others. In this connection, I learned a new word and verb 
um, last week, I think it was Thursday, when I was reading a sermon of a great preacher last century, an American theologian called B.B. Warfield. And he had a sermon on this very passage from Philippians chapter 2. And in the course of the sermon, he said this, Christ calls us not merely to self-denial, but to unselfishing ourselves. Well, there's a new word. I don't know if he made it up. I don't know if it's any dictionary. I don't know if it's an American dictionary. It probably is. They have all kinds of words there. But I suggest that it's perhaps a word to help us in our skills of modeling. For Christ-likeness means a continuing process of unselfishing ourselves. So how to be good? Well, in a word, Christ-likeness. Yes, but what does this involve? Can I suggest from our reading this morning, there are two things we should try and remember each day. And I'm putting them in picture form so that we can perhaps recall them. The first thing is to remember your working clothes. Remember your working clothes. When we get up in the morning, the first great issue and debate of the day is what we'll wear. And we wonder what we're going to choose to wear from the huge cupboard and wardrobe of clothes that we have. And that includes men as well as women. Now, in Christian terms, I'm suggesting that if we want to try and be good and Christ-like, remember to put on right away our working clothes. You'll not be surprised to learn that uh, trying to be good according to the Bible is very, very hard work. There was a, a great preacher last century a congregational preacher whose name was Alexander McLaren. And whenever he went into the study to prepare his sermons, he put on his tackety boots. You know what I mean by tackety boots? Great big laborers' boots with, with studs or tackets on the soles. He put on his tackety boots to go into the study in order to remind himself and to remind everybody in the house and to remind everybody in the congregation that heard what he was doing, that when he was going in to prepare preaching of the gospel, he was involved as something that was hard and demanding work. Now, if this is the case in teaching the gospel, how much more it is in living the gospel. So I want to suggest to you and to suggest to myself that every morning we remember to put on our spiritual tackety boots and our Christian boiler suits. And boiler suits nowadays are unisex, so this refers to women as well as men. Put on your working clothes, because to try to be good and Christ-like is very hard work. And I want you to notice three quick things about this work. First of all, it's continuous. Verse 12, continue to work out your salvation. And the verb that's used here means literally to work it out to the, to the finish. Work it right out to a conclusion. Work it out to the very end. So you see, this is work from which you can never be made redundant. And you can never retire. In my devotional readings to prepare for Christmas... I mean, looking at Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, and what a wonderful chapter it is. Just to read these words almost causes a shiver to go up and down the spine. And the glory of the, of the Christmas message. And I was reading the other morning about Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, who was a priest in the division of Abijah. And we read that Zechariah was a very old man. And the commentary I read told me that all the priests remained in the priesthood and never retired from the priesthood and stayed on until they dropped. Now that used to be the case in the Church of Scotland as well as far as ministers are concerned, but you'll be glad to know that there is a cut-off point now. That cut-off point is getting nearer all the time. 
But, but we retire. And all of us in society retire. But there is no retirement from this employment. There's never a chance of, of redundancy here. Because we do this until we drop this work. Until our dying days, there is the constant struggle of unselfishing, unselfishing ourselves and becoming like Jesus. So it's continuous work. The second thing to note is it's reverent work. Verse 12, glance down at what it says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now that's the Old Testament language for awe and reverence. You see, there is a temptation, isn't there? To appear to be good and Christ-like when other people are around, and particularly when it's Sunday. But when other people are not around, and it's the rest of the days and the week, the temptation is to stop working at it. And Paul recognizes this temptation in verse 12. Notice, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence continue to work. He's talking about the temptation. What is it in simple terms? Colloquial terms? When the cat's away, the mice will play and stop trying to be good. And the answer to that temptation is to remember that the work of Christ-likeness is always done under the eye of God. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, surely one of the greatest preachers uh, last century in this country, if not the Western world, had on his study desk as a young man and kept it there until his retirement a text from the Bible which said simply this, Thou, God, seest me. What a text. And what a reminder to carry around with us that wherever we are and whatever we're doing, our work at trying to be good is done under the eye of Almighty God, God who is holy and loving. And so you see fear and trembling, awe and reverence. This is reverent work as well as continuous work. But notice thirdly, it's confident work. Work out your salvation, verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to do of his good purpose. So it's not a question of to let go and let God, as some modern Christians say. No, it's not that at all. It's a question of working out what has been worked in by us. And in every Christian believer, God has worked in that life. A work of grace, a work of the Holy Spirit. So that we do have everything that we need for life and godliness. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. So we are confident that God will empower us to help us in this work of trying to be good and trying to be Christ-like. So we are to put on our working clothes. Do that every morning as we work at being good. So when temptations come to complain or be argumentative in congregational life or in personal life, we have to stop right away and remember our model, the model mindset and model ourselves upon it and work hard to model ourselves upon this mindset and work hard at biting our tongues and counting up to 10 or counting to 20 or repeating to ourselves, speech is silver, silence is golden, or whatever helps, but above all, to remember that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world and we'll be helped and strengthened to carry out this work. So there's the first thing. In cultivating Christ-likeness, Remember your working clothes. It's hard work. But the second thing that struck me from this passage was this. Remember your lights. 
remember your lights. Something we drivers have to do in these dark days in December. It's something that I'm constantly forgetting to do as the gloom descends. And it's only when another driver flashes his lights at me that I remember and then turn the switch at the foot of my steering column to the right. Now, spiritually speaking, I'm suggesting that the second thing we do each day when we go down to breakfast in the morning, or perhaps even before that, when we are washing or showering or shaving or whatever form our ablutions take, remember your lights. Verse 14, do everything without complaining or arguing. Verse 15, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. What a wonderful and beautiful expression, which is borrowed surely from the Old Testament and from Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. What a glorious thing it is to be a Christian, even in the darkness of our society this Christmas time. And there is darkness, not just for the Philippians, in the first century culture, but for Christonians in our 21st century culture. Notice how he describes the society around him, a crooked and depraved generation. Literally that means a generation that's distorted in true values. That's to say a generation which calls wrong right and which regards that which is bad as good. And don't you think that's quite an accurate description of our culture in our days? The first front page of, of the magazine The Week a couple of weeks ago had this headline, Was Mary Whitehouse Right? Alluding to an article inside on the death of the former First Secretary of the National Viewers and Listeners Association and the one who initiated the Clean Up Television campaign. And over her years, says the writer of the article, and uh, we surely all know this, Mary Whitehouse was mocked for her housewifely appearance and ridiculed for her moralistic stance. Yet, says the writer... Can anyone watching television today really say that Mrs. Whitehouse, who died last week, was wrong? What a world of moral and spiritual darkness. What a world for our young folks to grow up in and to try and find some guidance to make their way safely through life. But what an opportunity for us who claim to be Christian people to shine like stars in the universe. Do you remember when we were children, we used to sing, Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. What, I wonder, are we to be like as Christian stars shining in this dark universe? Well, we're told here, we're to shine firstly in our lives as blameless, harmless, Faultless. That's the three Greek words that are used in verse 15. It doesn't mean sinless. We'll never be sinless. But these three words do show us the goal of Christian character, which God intends for us through his gospel. It's tremendous. And which one day he will perfect in all of those who are his people. So remember to shine in our lives. And secondly, remember to shine with our lips. Examples not enough, there has to be explanation. As we, verse 16, hold out the word of life to others. Now there's opportunity to do that at this time of the year, even in a tiny way. What if everybody in this church this morning was to speak to and invite three people that they knew to our Christmas services? Now that's a very basic and tiny thing. But uh, who knows what might come from that? 
shine with your lips, hold out the word of life. Remember your lights. A few weeks ago, we had some fault with the floodlights in the car park. And just suddenly they went very dark at about seven o'clock at night. And uh, it was a great darkness in the area around our house. So what a relief and what a transformation when the fault was fixed and the lights were turned on. You can see. And what a transformation Christian people can make in this realm and sphere and world of darkness by shining with life and lip and helping people as they're, as they're struggling and groping and not coping with life in all the moral and spiritual confusion of the days in which we are living. Remember your lights. What a calling. Paul is thinking of these wonderful words in this verse from Daniel 12, verse 5. Let me read this tremendous text because it, it really is extremely inspirational, I would suggest. And this is the verse that Paul definitely has in his mind as he uses this imagery. Daniel 12, verse 3. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. What a calling. What a privilege. What an honor to be placed in this dark world to give light that will lead people to righteousness forever and forever. So you see the stakes are high. The final advent is before us. Verse 16, the day of Christ is at hand. But until the final advent, all our work as Christian people, all our service in the church should be characterized by gladness and joy, verse 17. Gladness and joy, verse 18. So may joy and gladness fill your hearts this Christmas time as you work and seek for goodness and godliness and Christ likeness in your lives. May the Lord. Bless his word and write it upon our souls this Advent Sunday. Let's pray together. O oh God, your word is always up to the minute. And perhaps some of us here have been squirming and trying to shut our ears and trying to allow ourselves to be distracted by anything and everything rather than hear your word for our souls. If that's the case, Lord, forgive us and help us and give to us by your Holy Spirit that desire to be all that your word and gospel calls us to be. How we praise you for the Lord Jesus who gave up his glory to come to this earth to save us and to be our friend and to be our companion and saviour and redeemer and Lord and guide. We thank you for the example that he left. And we ask that we might have the attitude, the mind that was in Christ Jesus. As we relate to others, as we deal and cope with tensions and differences in our relationships. Oh, help us to remember our calling Help us to remember 
the glorious employment of being Christ-like. Help us to remember the glorious work of making you known to people. And I ask you that this word will not return to you in heaven empty. I ask you in the name of your Son that it will find a lodging place in some minds and hearts. Yes, in all our minds and hearts. So that as a result there may come the fruits of righteousness and holiness and joy and true merriment at this season of the year. We ask this, that you might be glorified through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.